being a wizard is sometimes quite a bit of a burden, actually. You have all of this magic at your at your fingertips, really, and one is expected, I suppose, um, encouraged, really, to make use of that magic in one way, shape, or form or another. But a lot of us forget our origins, forget our roots, where we came from. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM or DM or narrator or storyteller or creator or master of the game or whatever you want to call yourself. Welcome, 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 welcome to each and every single one of you. So, uh, I'm not sure how long I've got to talk on this particular subject, but if I could just have a moment to think back on when I was a lad and I was just discovering magic and... Uh, what are we talking about today? Well, it's... PC character building episode on the wizard. Yes, you are a wizard, Harry, as they say. Uh, chasing after um, a weasel, as a matter of fact. A very lovely little weasel. His name was, was Marmaduke. And um, I was chasing Marmaduke up this orange tree. Or was it an apple tree? So uh, how do we make wizards? How do we make wizards interesting? Well, if you haven't watched the video on how to make fighters uh, interesting, I would suggest you go and have a look. That video came out last month. It gives you the basics. So, I... Sh well, once Daddy died, I became the king, and um, I didn't really need to use the magic so much anymore. Sh I'm going to give you the three initial steps that you need to do for every single different character type, by the way, just very, very quickly. You need to give them a name. The name is going to inspire you. It's going to encourage you. It's going to give you some ideas as to who this individual is. You need to give them a basic backstory, answering the five backstory questions, which you can find in that video, link down below. And then you need to give them, the choose their species for whatever game system you are applying or using, etc., etc. Those are the three very basic things that you need to do before we jump into the nitty gritty of it. Then if you hit that like button, that would make me really happy. If you like these videos, which I hope you do because you're watching them. And if you don't like them, don't hit the like button. Let's have uh, transparency in terms of what and what we do and do not like. Okay, so now that I've done with that, where do we start? Well, I, I think the question that everyone asks first and foremost is, is um, what really, where, where does it come from? Why, why, why is it there? What is the power? Why magic is really the question that we need to ask ourselves first. Why Why is it here? Why do we have it? Why do I have it and you don't, for example? What's, what's the difference about from breeding, status, money, and, of course, general talent? But aside from that, you know, what, what are the differences? Seriously. There are rule systems that have different means or methods of how the character would have their abilities their magical abilities, their wizard abilities, specifically their wizard abilities. But why? Why do they want to develop them? Why do they want to encourage them to, to, to flourish? What does your character feel about this, this, this magic? Do they feel powerful? Do they, do they believe that this, this magic is going to give them power? And Bearing in mind, we're not talking maniacal power over the elements of life and death. <laughs> it could be that. It could also be the power to create interesting architecture or the power to heal the wounded. Not many wizards can heal, but the power to restore a broken object to uh, being complete again. The power to summon forth strange and wonderful illusions. So we talk about that kind of power, the control of one's element uh, or environment, I should say. That's the kind of power that we're talking about. Is it perhaps natural talent? This is where their powers come from. It's something that they have, and it's, it's, it's no more mysterious or wonderful than why you are left-handed or why you are right-handed, or why you like coffee but you don't like tea. You have magic, you don't have magic. You use magic in your day-to-day -day existence, or you don't. Look at the two very different aspects. One empowers, the other one is just something that you've always had. So you might be a bit more callous about it. Oh, well, doesn't can't everyone open a door from six feet away by just thinking about it and using, you know, the power of, of, of magic? No, not everyone can. Oh, well, it, it's a neither here nor there for me. Or, 
I have unlocked the secrets of opening doors using amazing formula and arcane divine power. Very different, right? And then the third type is cultural enforcement. Sometimes when we look at cultures, can you imagine if magic was real here on Earth? Real magic, as in the power to create a ball of fire in your hand or to bring down a lightning bolt on command, not with just meticulous timing and heavy amounts of science. All of that kind of stuff. If that was real, you can bet your bottom dollar that a cultural enforcement would be huge. If you had even the smallest aptitude for magic, you would be pushed into special defensive offensive magic academies where your abilities would be pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And if you didn't have, well, then you would be sidelined as providing services for those that did. And of course, the counter to that, which is the more tropey approach, is magic is seen as evil and those that have it are outcasts or are uh, disregarded. Look at how that magic is going to express itself. It's not power. It's not natural talent. It's, oh, I'm hiding it away because I don't want to get persecuted. Or, yes, of course I have magic. I'm brilliant. You're not, but I am. So accept it and move on just interesting ways of thinking about just the the expression of magic right so next up mummy always used to say that the great mages were the ones who understood where their magic came from and who adopted an approach to mastering that magic now whether that is uh, study or just natural latent talent that needs no shackling. We need to know what is the general approach that ma mages will take when, when dealing with their power. Isn't it a funny thing? I, 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 a lot of people say to me, oh, you know so much stuff. Uh, not really. I, I really know just a very small amount of stuff, but I do know sometimes a bit more than some other people know. Uh, but why? What's the difference? Well, it's my approach to knowledge. And uh, well, you can apply the same thing to magic. That's the whole purpose of this analogy. If you are academic, you're focused on specifically understanding things. And there are academics who just focus on a single area of a broader topic. That is a hyper-focused, hyper-detailed, but as invasively complete as possible. An academic wizard is someone who wants to understand the fundamentals of magic or the specific fundamentals of an aspect of magic and so have rigorously explored it and experimented and made notes and has read other people's notes and compares notes and is very, very rigid in their approach. There is a academic distancing to a certain degree or an academic obsession with a, with a particular type of magic that comes with this kind of stuff. Unlike, say, a sage, who's very much more about understanding in broad terms, seeing the connections between this type of magic and that type of magic, how this spell interacts with that kind of spell, but not from an academic, cold, dispassionate kind of, oh, I understand now this sigil and that sigil, when they combine, they actually form a new sigil which causes the magic to come into being. A sage is more along the lines of, what well, we know when we combine these two together, a new emerges. How do we use that? How do, we, how do we use that in our existence? Not just understand it. How do we use it? How do we apply it? So the sage is much more about applied magic. You then get the renaissance man, effectively. The, the, the mage who is using magic for everything. It's utilitarian. It's, it's I'm gonna, I need to build a bridge. Okay, I can use this magic or I can use this magic. I can also use engineering and my ability to read, to make plans, to actually physically build this bridge whilst using some of that magic and some of this and some of that and some of that. So the Renaissance man, the Renaissance idea is literally they have many different disciplines that they bring together as tools, as, as art forms, really, 
to create something anew. They're not the academic who would specifically use the right spell or would try and research the right spell. They're not the sage who would perhaps use a spell just to knock a tree down to get a bridge over a chasm. They are someone who's going to be using all of those things kind of combined to create this thing. Renaissance men and women are very uncommon because they are multidisciplinarian. If you think of the great Renaissance period, after which the term comes, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, they weren't just painters or sculptors. They were engineers, they were philosophers, they were writers, they were artists. They, there was a whole lot of things that went in there. And they were just as fallible as the rest of us, by the way. All right, so we have Renaissance, and then we have accidental. This is the one who, who doesn't pay attention, didn't study at school, has no understanding isn't about combining is just hey oh whoa i needed a bridge and a bridge was built because i waved my hands around or perhaps because i thought it into exist there's no understanding there's no need for understanding because it's just as as it happens and if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen there isn't a dedicated approach very different types of wizards here and as with the fighter Look at how your wizard would go about expressing their magic now. The academic is going to be not necessarily cold, but very clinical, very trying to understand things. The sage is going to be trying to link things together and go with the flow of what can and can't be done. The Renaissance is going to be using lots of different things to build one specific outcome. And the accidental is just going to be going along and having fun. The accidental, by the way, I think is perhaps one of the easier ones to play because you as the player don't have to think too much about what you're doing. Is it the most rewarding? I think it certainly can be very rewarding. All of the different types can be very, very rewarding. Think about it. Which one are you going to choose? Once we've done that, what's next? There are some schools of thought. Those are copyrighted there and under an OGL that is no longer available. There are some schools of thought that magic is categorized into different areas, different disciplines, if you will. And by focusing on a discipline or on all disciplines, as a matter of fact, for the truly talented, focusing on all disciplines, um, one can measure the mage, as it were, and obviously some disciplines are nicer than others by their nature, but we don't judge. No, not in the magic circles. We don't, we don't judge. No. Okay, so this one is very dependent on the role-playing system that you might be using. Your system might not have different types of magic. Your system might just have magic. And then there's just different types of spells. So whether it's a different type of magic or it's a different type of spell uh, grouping that they use, up to you to decide, up to you to curate and to, to, to apply as you see fit. But if I look at the list, it can be an exhaustive list. It can be quite a long list. So I've written it down. We've got destructive magic. Is it fire, lightning, something that demolishes, blows up, explodes. So magic that is much more violent in nature. Is it necromantic magic? So magic that deals with the dead, with raising the dead, controlling the dead, everything to do with necroses, with the rotting of the flesh, that kind of thing. Is it uh, protective? Is it more about protecting yourself and others than it is about being offensive and being aggressive and all that kind of stuff? And remember, when we talk about these different types of preferred magic or preferred spell groupings, you still apply that to the type of mage that your your your, your wizard is. So if they're academic, their spell choices from within these categories would be the ones that are, well, we need to annihilate uh, 12 uh, ogres. A fireball would be the most appropriate spell because it has an area of effect and it does this and it does that and ogres are not immune to fire. The sage would understand that perhaps ogres are terrified of lightning and so using lightning would simulate a lightning storm and so then they might run away. So rather than attacking the, the, the ogres directly, going with more, say, um, utility magic, which is the next type of magic you can have, we'll be using things to, to do other things perhaps let's put all the ogres to sleep. Let's let's use coercive magic. We'll be controlling their minds. 
just very different approaches, very fun approaches. And when combined with the type of magic and the reason where that magic came from becomes much more interesting. So we've got coercive, we've got utility, we've got illusionary. We create illusions that are transient. They're just, they're just there for a moment and then they're gone, but they do their job. Maybe it's prophetic. We can read minds or we can predict the future or look into the future or cast ourselves from here to somewhere else. Perhaps it's a combination of those. Maybe it's creation magic. We summon up creatures from the depths or we create a weird and wonderful creature out of found parts. It's almost necromantic, isn't it? We can combine and put these things together to, to, to get to the space. Now, if you look at someone like Leonardo da Vinci, he was a Renaissance wizard in terms of he had lots of different dis disciplines, but he was definitely into necromancy. He studied the human body, so did Michelangelo, as much as they could to enhance their understanding of the other bits and pieces, their sculptures and their paintings and those kinds of things. It was a very, very specific purpose for that necromancy and utility. They both designed buildings and structures and things. They needed to have a utilitarian understanding of things. So very, very interesting when you sort of step back and you look at these characters from history. Yes, obviously, they weren't casting actual magic. They were doing real practical things. But it just gives you an example, I, I hope. OK, uh, let's, just, let's move on. You know, when, when one, one hears this next thing, you might laugh. But there are different types of magic in, in terms of how we draw from it. What it is exactly, this intangible thing, well, that's up for you to decide and for the role-playing system that you're using to dictate. But how we express that, what exactly are we doing when we, when we cast a spell, that's very, very useful to know. And uh, he'll tell you more. Again, this is something that is dependent on your role-playing system. So take this one with a pinch of salt, but it should still help inspire you on how to play an awesome wizard to different types. We know we've got blood magic. Now, again, if your role-playing system doesn't support one of these different types of magic, you can always propose it to your GM as flavoring. If I have a player who comes to me and says, you know, I have the spell Cone of Cold from Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, um... Could it be a cone of, uh, instead of a cone still fine, cold? Well, it just does cold damage. So could it be a, co a cone of ice shards rather than a cone of cold? Or could it be a cone of nitrogen gas rather than just cold? For sure. Go ahead. Change it up. There are feats that allow you to change the uh, basic uh, nature of spells anyway. So just by flavoring it, you're not changing the basic spell mechanics for whatever system you're using. You're just changing the way it's visually represented. Most GMs shouldn't have a problem with that. But check with your GM first before you suddenly start doing this because you'll confuse the hell out of them if you're describing the spell using blood magic and they're going, what the hell are you casting? Oh, magic missile? Why the hell are you pricking yourself? Oh, you need three drops for three magic missiles. Okay, I got you. I got you. This is cool. Look at how, by applying the type of magic to all of the other steps that we've been speaking about, your wizard in spell combat, or just in combat in general, is suddenly so much more interesting. So we've got blood magic. We've got words. The verbal component. I use words. My favorite, favorite magical incantation of all time, probably because I heard it when I was about 11 and it's just stuck with me forever. The incantation of Merlin from the film. Uh, you tell me. What film? Comments down below. All right. Um, then we've got mathematics. So it is mathematical equations. This idea of seeing the numbers and realizing that if you divide this by that and you just move your hand through the air to create just enough of a wind current, the speed of the wind is enough to do this, to do this, to do this. And you can combine all these kind of wonderful things together and you hold up a prism or you, you don't or you move to a certain spot just at the right time. You've calculated all of the variables and bingo, the spell happens. Mathematics is a great one. Combined elements. I bring forth a raven's feather and the eye of a newt who now wears a patch, as well as the fingers of a four-fingered toad who's now only three-fingered. Um, I bring these together to make a little ball that I throw at you and it's icky and it also explodes dealing fire damage. Great, great, great options. 
am I saying that every time you cast a spell, you need to give us a 10 minute dialogue as to how you are doing it? Not at all. What I am saying, though, is that every now and again, when your character has a moment to shine or everyone is relying on your character to do something, you can drop in these descriptions and it brings it to life tremendously. It really, really, really makes it pop. And that's what we're looking for. Gestures, of course, the hand weave, the fingers, uh, making circles in the air. We've seen visual representations of those with Marvel, for example. Gestures are, are a fun one. Again, though, if your role-playing system has specific requirements, very specifically says, oh, it is verbal and gesture, okay, cool, well, then you combine those two together. Be guided by your role-playing system. And that, that the reason why they list those is there must be some mechanical property that can be affected later on. So this is where we can't change it up and go, well, yeah, but I want my stuff to be blood magic. Yes, but blood magic potentially could circumnavigate other spells that prevent verbal components or spell components or gestures from taking place. So it's going to destabilize the game. Think about that. So don't break the rules. Keep within the rules, but flavor, flavor, flavor. And then finally, implements. I have a wand because wands are cool. And if you break the wand, you can't cast magic or a staff. Staves are, are traditionally ones that are really, really cool because you break them in half and then the sorcerer has no power. Uh, all kinds of wonderful things like that. Personally, if I was a magic user and I had to have an implement that I could cast my magic through, I would have it embedded under the skin of a body part that I could then use just to make it a little bit more difficult for the hero to break it in half it's like in order to prevent me from casting magic you have to cut my hand off ah. well i mean worse better than the staff being okay never mind staffs are a good idea stick with staffs okay anything else we need to talk about some of the big questions to ask your character why do they love magic and why do they hate it and what would they be if they didn't have it? These are, are very deep questions, but they are questions that are quite useful to answer. Mainly, you know, if I didn't have magic, well, I'd just be a normal king, I suppose, and I'd hire other magic users. If I hated magic, if I didn't like the fundamental power that it, it gives you, um, what would I what would I do? How would I express that? How would I use my magic if I didn't want to use magic? Reluctantly, I suppose. But why wouldn't you want to use magic? It's the god force. It really is the differentiator between the common man and, and, and mortals like myself. So uh, but you answer those questions and you'll find find depth in there that that you never knew you had or and I just don't have. Big, 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 big. Big questions and fun questions to answer. And I think that what is important is that when you are answering those three questions, look at how those answers might change over time. So if your character hates magic and they hate using magic, how can they go on a journey where by the end of your adventures they actually enjoy using magic or they begrudgingly like magic? Why do I propose these character journeys? What do they do for you as the player? Well, they keep your character fresh. Not only is your character potentially leveling up or gaining abilities and powers, but if you are running this little story as well in the background, it's for your own benefit. And actually, it's for the benefit of the rest of the players around the table too. If you are going on this and your character is evolving and, and a player sitting back opposite you goes, I remember when your character hated magic and now they, they don't really hate it so much anymore. That's pretty cool. They have seen your character's journey in their heads. Your character is much more real now than the character who has very much not changed throughout the entire campaign. So thinking about these journeys that you can go on, starting at position A and ending up at position B by several adventures and that sort of thing, it does create a much more dynamic character. It also means that when you are casting these spells, if you love magic, there's a glee in kind of building the spell up and then sending it off or when new spell books are found or spell magical items or whatever it is, there's a, a relish to it. If it's hatred or if it's dismissal or if it's intimidation, 
those things are just adding to your pool of role playing options, making you a better role player. That's the bottom line. Well, in all seriousness, I do want to thank each and every single one of you for coming here today and to listening to what we had to say. If, of course, you did like what we had to say or you agreed with what we had to say, that like button is just begging, begging for your, your attention just for a moment. It doesn't cost you anything, really, but uh, it means everything to me. So hit that like button. And, of course, if you like this content, let us know in the comments down below what kind of wizard you are. What, where, where is, what are your origin stories? What type of magic do you use? All of the things we've covered in today's video. And um, to all of you who are patrons of the channel, cannot express my gratitude enough for you allowing this foolishness to continue, and hopefully it brings you as much joy as it brings to me and to us here at the channel. Until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest, the very happiest of gaming.